All right. The Messianic Hope Part 6. Honestly, when I started this out and wanted to do the Messianic Hope, I planned on one class. That's what happens when I start planning things. Um, I really, but I, I, after looking at it, I really wanted to dive into kind of the aspects of all portions of the, of the Hebrew scriptures and dealing with why we understand the Old Testament to be predictive in nature. Remember the definition of the Messianic hope is in the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures. There is a theme and a message that those who lived during that time and who would read the Old Testament would conclude that there is a message from God that demonstrates a prediction and a promise of a figure that would come, restore Israel, and reconcile the world to God. Now, that's oversimplification. There's a lot of details found within there, obviously. So don't. it's not, it's not exclusive. There are some things down here that which I would probably add, but then the definition would get extremely long. It would not fit on one slide. So therefore, we kind of just hone it down a little bit um, and make sure that we understand that the Old Testament reader, if you're 100 B.C., you're reading the Old Testament, what are you looking for? Why are you reading this? What's the overall end game? And that would be the overall thought that there's something that's coming that it hasn't gotten here yet. And for us, looking back, because we already know how it's fulfilled, we'll go over that actually, um, but we, we already know how it's fulfilled, we have to make sure that we're grounded. We'll ground ourselves in the foundational elements of messianic understanding so that we are confident. Why do we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world? Why do we believe we have forgiveness in his name? Just because it's written down somewhere? Messianic prediction is the basis for why it's true. I can go back and I, I can go back and review my life and then start to write down all of my elements and then say I wrote it beforehand. That wouldn't make it true. But we actually have evidence, observable evidence, that the Old Testament written prior to Jesus Christ and how he fulfills that those promises and those predictions. And that makes it real, not just a good story. Ever read a book and you go, wow, I love how the characters come together and how things intertwine. Oh, at the end, I didn't see that coming. That was so awesome. That's how people usually think about the Bible as written as kind of like everything already thought out. What they don't realize is the predictive nature. This allows us to have an, uh, a confidence in the Bible and about the person of Jesus Christ that goes beyond prag pragmatism, beyond it works for me or it sounds good or I think that makes sense. It's true. Unwavering, able to use the scriptures properly, the Old Testament scriptures. We can use those. How many times do you witness or you have a conversation with somebody and you go to the book of Isaiah? You should. To reason with unbelievers demonstrated that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, and all who believe in him have eternal life. It's important. We need to be able to do that. If you want to have confidence in what you believe, you have to start with the predictive elements. So the Messianic hope so far, uh, again, we, we take our, our verse, we, the New Testament, we take Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 47, in order to establish why we do this study. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. This is after his resurrection. That all things which are written about me in the law of, Mo law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So we go, if you read this, shouldn't you go, huh, I remember reading the Psalms. I don't remember hearing any of that. And it makes you go back and reread these books and this information with a new perspective, the perspective of, is it messianic? In fact, it's, it's okay to ask that question of every single section of scripture. However, be careful, not every section is messianic. It contains a lot of messianic promises. And one of the most beautiful concepts I find, especially with the poets, is that it leaves with a, of a concept of hope. Not necessarily what, it, what the hope is, but it's, this isn't the end. Israel is going to die. It's not the end. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I don't believe that's supernatural. I think he explained to them the scriptures clearly enough for them to be able to understand it fully. And he said to them, this is, this is, that, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed to his name in all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
It's a, it's a vital to understand that the, the message of the grace of God is not unique to this age. It was from the beginning, and it's through the Messiah. So the Messianic prophecy began in Genesis, and, and, uh, and we went through from Genesis into the historical information, increasing more and more in distinctness from the Torah through the historical narrative. We have more information revealed both to the identity and to the function of Messiah. Who is he? What will he do? And the poetry, um, we have uh, overt predictive elements about the Messiah. There's also that tone that depends upon the hope of the future Messiah. Why would you have a hope if there is no future Messiah? The Messianic promise is developing all the more as you read from left to right. Now, again, I know that there's differences in how the books are laid out in the Hebrew scriptures. If you have a Hebrew Bible or ours, we went from left to right in our Bible, and it still flows very nicely from less descriptive to more descriptive. As we go to the poetries, we understand that the nature of Messiah, he'll be both God and kin. Fantastic in the book of Job. Most people don't look at Job being Messianic, but there's definitely elements there. He will die yet remain. He will rule forever and be a priest forever in the Psalms. Last time we talked, uh, we dealt with the prophetic books. All right. Um, we did an overview of the prophetic books dealing with some of the most famous uh, predictions made in the, in, the, in the minor and major prophets. But we ended up in Isaiah 53 where we concluded that uh, there would be a servant that would not come initially as the all-powerful king. Remember, the, the main thing you're looking for from this Messiah is reconciliation of all things, particularly Israel being restored to its original state and peace and prosperity and respect from all nations will be brought to Israel. And they go, that's what we're looking for. We, we, we ignore that, that, that death thing that's in there. They do. They ignore it. They don't want that. They're looking for that Messiah, Ben David, that reigning Messiah, the, the, the coalescence. They don't like the Messiah, Ben Isaiah. I, I know that's not what they say, but they, the, the Isaiah Messiah, they tone that down. First, he comes lowly and humble as a sacrifice for many. Now we get to something I geek out over, and that is, Specifics. I love when the Bible is predicted in specifics. And it's like, it is so cool that you can go back and understand Daniel written many hundred years before Christ. And we have actual data and this demonstration through the Dead Sea Scrolls that back that up. And then we start seeing some information in there that actually lead us to understand that the Bible is not simply just written from hindsight. If Isaiah 53 is the key to understanding the sacrificial atonement of the Messiah, then Daniel 9 is probably the linchpin that kind of puts it all together. In fact, many theologians, Wolbert, um, uh, Radelnik, other individuals, Ryrie and, uh, and Schaefer, all kind of look at Daniel 9 as kind of the linchpin to biblical prophecy. It's even some people even suggest that Daniel 9 actually kind of is the center point of the entire Bible because of the overt messianic understanding that we have in the book of Daniel. Specifically, it takes it from where they are to where they're going to be in a little while and all the way to the end in Daniel 9 in just a few verses. But a detailed analysis of Daniel 9 really kind of sums it up. Now, we're not going to do a detailed analysis. In Daniel 9, now, um, so you can turn there if you want, but just turn to Daniel at least and just kind of peruse the book a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how many people have actually read the book of Daniel. It's made into a couple of different movies, you know, and it's kind of interesting how they do it. It's 11 chapters. Uh, sorry, 12 chapters. I keep on doing that with Daniel. 12 chapters, um, but it's a little bit longer than the other prophets, but it's different. It's laid out differently. Jeremiah and Daniel have a lot of similarities where Jeremiah is kind of dealing with um, a lot of history. Jeremiah much longer. 
Daniel shorter, but still um, very a lot of information contained within. And Daniel not, not exposes not only the timeline predictive element, but it also has some information about the person and function of the Messiah. The content of the book of Daniel rotates between historical references and prophetic dreams and visions. The historical references are about Daniel and other Israelites, you know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and they all burn in a Winnebago. Um, I know. Old joke, still funny. But fortunately, none of my kids are here right now. They'd be like, oh. <laughs> that's okay. I'm only here to entertain myself. Um, the, 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 the historical references are actually contained in chapter 1. Just, I would just open your Bibles and just look at Daniel chapter 1. Just look at it. and just If you have a, like a, a titles there, you can see Daniel's resolve, the choice young man. This is where they, they don't eat you know, the, the bad food. They only eat the good food. They, cho they choose to educate themselves properly and according to the law, not according to Nebuchadnezzar. And then chapter 2, dreams and interpretations. Chapter 3. The king's golden image, uh, this is Daniel's friends, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and then you have to skip to chapter 5 for more details. Now, chapter 5 is a little bit different. This is Belshazzar's feast. This is the writing on the wall. So you have a narrative with a tiny bit of predictive element. And then chapter 6 goes back into um, that narrative. That historical narrative, I, I call it supplemental narrative. Now, the dreams, visions, and predictive elements are about the plan of God for the future of Israel, the Messiah, and the future of the Gentile nations. You get a lot of detail about the surrounding nations, the surrounding Gentile nations, the Greeks, the Persians, the Medes, the Babylonians. You get a lot of information dealing with that, and also some Gentile nations that are yet to come. And a lot of people fight over the meaning of this, and some of it's very specific. It's interpreted for you, and some things are left kind of like not going to tell you. And when God doesn't tell you, what do we do with it? We, we let God have his mysteries. Because sometimes predictive elements are not meant to be fully understood in the, in the now, if it's still in our future, but it's supposed to be reflected upon when it becomes true. In Daniel chapter 7 through 8 is a vision of the four beasts. Now, if you read this, not from the story element, just read it and put yourself in Daniel's place. You ever read in the third person trying to put yourself in the actual scene and try to deal with the actual content as if you were seeing this yourself? You, you, would, you would die from fear. How do I know that? Because Daniel almost dies from fear. He is trembling. He is exhausted at the end of this vision in Daniel 7 and 8. In fact, um, look, at, look at verse 7, chapter 8, verse 27. At the end of this vision, take it literally, then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Now, this is after some of the information was explained to him about who people are. But he's going, I don't know what to do with this. And then chapter 9. Chapter 9 picks up a Daniel reading in the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah gave a prophecy. Look at verse 2. In the first year of the reign, Daniel observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet for the completion of desolations of, of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. And Daniel goes, hey, we're almost done. And then that causes him to pray. So in response to this, Daniel prayed a passionate and hopeful prayer. And that's in verses 4 through 19, which we're not going to read. Okay. In response to the prayer, 
Gabriel comes. That's verses 20 through 23. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplications before the Lord, my God, on behalf of the holy mountain of my God, he's passionate about returning back. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. And he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I had and I come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. What vision? The vision from chapter 7 and 8. All right? So he's going to get the completed, the big picture concept here. And that is Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Here, let's read it. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place, so that you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and tell Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. We'll talk about why there's a division there. It will build, be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant, and the he here is basically the prince that is to come, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings, and on, a, on the wing of abominations will come even the one who makes desolate. The desolations of abominations. Even until complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Whew, there's a lot. Again, I can take a long time to kind of go through this. Now, so what happens here is God reveals details about the timing of the Messiah would come with additional details about the events, what's going to happen and take place. The, the, the timing is very specific, although we do have to look at it from the, ask some questions about the text and dealing with the timing. So while Daniel was praying, Gabriel was sent by God to provide Daniel understanding of the vision that was seen by Daniel in the previous two chapters. Said already, making a point. Why is this predictive element key to understanding all the predictions of the Old Testament? You don't have to turn there. I got it up for you. First Peter chapter one, verses 10 through 12. As to this salvation, speaking of the Christ, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you make careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or what time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. See, when they would write about it, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, they were writing these things and they're going... When is this going to happen? Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things, you have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The Old Testament prophets, Large amount of them had no idea when it was going to occur. They only knew some elements about the nature of Jesus Christ. They knew some of the content of his character and the fact that he would die and raise again. That's what it says in verse 11 right here, right? How he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. That's all they knew. Daniel completes the picture. It's kind of like reading the Bible and trying to put it all together without the book of Revelation. It puts it nice and neat and together for you. And when you go, when we start chapter four and you start going through all this different information, you're going to see how uh, Luther, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving him a task. He's already told me he's doing this. How he has to go back and pull from other locations to complete the picture. Daniel does that for the Old Testament. He pulls it together with a timeline. 
So in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, we have a 70 weeks have been decreed. And that's a lot of details. For what? To finish transgressions, to make amend to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness and seal up visions and prophecy to anoint. Now, some great stuff found in here. Do they all happen at the same time? Hmm. Some great questions. We're not going to answer them all. From the time of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, there's a point of mark. You know, okay, like we'll go ahead and set our watches for one hour and mark. There's a point of time in the Bible when we press go. We have it set for 70 weeks, and then when do we say go? From the time of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, there's questions about that. When does that actually take place? Okay, but still, we hit go. Number three, after the, after the time that is decreed, the Messiah will be cut off. What does that mean? Yeah, he's going to be dead. And he won't have you left with nothing. Why? Because he won't be here. He's cut off. Right now, do you don't realize that Jesus Christ is cut off? He is not on his throne. He is the, the duly reigning king. He's supposed to be reigning. He's waiting until his enemies become a footstool for his feet. Then he's going to come back. And then it talks about the final week. The final week is also what we call Jacob's trouble. Okay. Um, and what is commonly thought of as the great tribulation. So a lot of information. Now. We have to deal with this question of what is the 70 weeks. Because uh, the time of Daniel, 70 weeks from then, is, is, is not that long, right? Now, we understand that there's a cutoff point at the 69 week to 70. There's a cutoff. There's a space and time here. And that's obvious within the text. But what does this weeks really represent? Well, first of all, it's translated weeks. That's not what it actually means. The word here is uh, shabu'im, which means... A unit of seven. Now, typically, the unit of seven is dealing with days. So if you're dealing with days, what do we have? It's a week, obviously. All right. But in Daniel chapter nine, verse two, the context determines that he is dealing with what? In the first year of the reign, I, I Daniel observed the books, which number of the years, which the which was revealed by as the Lord. And so he's trying to understand the vision looking at the years, looking at this number 70, and this God likes, God loves symmetry, okay? He loves, you know, having these ideas. Read Matthew, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, even in and out. Love symmetry. So in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, we have to try to ask the question, based upon the context, what unit of seven are we dealing with? If you, if you literally read it in verse 24, it says 70 periods of seven. Seven what? Weeks makes no sense. How, how, did, how does a, uh, the prince make a, a covenant for a week? Anybody make a one-week covenant? You know what? Ceasefire, one week. And halfway through that week, I'm not even going to wait seven days. Halfway through, three and a half days on Wednesday, I'm breaking it. What? That doesn't fit within the context. So an actual week does not make sense. Months, months are never mentioned here in this particular context. Years is the concern. And so therefore, seven, 70 years of seven year periods. Now, this is actually very common. Very common that the Bible deals with seven year periods. Uh, you have it um, in Exodus 21.2. That's dealing with slavery. If you uh, acquire a slave after in the seventh year, you release him. Leviticus 25, uh, 1 through 4, when you acquire land, you get basically give it rest. Deuteronomy 15, 31, it all deals with these concepts of seven-year periods within the law. It's very common for them to understand this. There's also stories and accounts. Joseph's famine lasted seven years. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Solomon's temple, built by Solomon, was built in seven years. Elisha's famine in 2 Kings lasted seven years. 
So these are very common numbers for them. And so when Daniel got this vision, I believe without a doubt, he would understand that there are 77 year periods, no doubt. Some people want to argue. Good luck proving that because 77 year periods makes the most sense. So look at it again. Verse 25 so uh, you are to know and discern that from the issuing and decree uh, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and tell Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. I've heard uh, several different strange explanations for this. I don't think I have the answer. I think I have a probable answer as to why there is a break. Seven year period, seven, seven year period would be 49 years. After, during the temple re being rebuilt and subsequent information to follow, there was a heightened sense of prophecy. You got Habakkuk, you have uh, Zephaniah, you have Zechariah, you have uh, Amos, Joel, all kind of highly involved during this time of the rebuilding of the temple. I might have a few people prior to still pre-exile on that one. Sorry about that. I'll double check my, my math there. But there's a heightened sense of, of, of prophetic utterances during the time of the rebuilding of the temple. The last person to speak is Malachi, which we say 400 years, right? And, actual, and so it's actually, we don't know exactly when Malachi was written, right? We have an idea based upon some of the details. But I believe that there that the silent period is marked by that seven seven year period. So there will be sixty two seven year periods of silence, which equals about what's the number? Four hundred and thirty eight. Four hundred thirty four. Something like that. Um, my math might be a little off there, but there's four hundred and thirty ish years of silence. That makes sense. I believe that the seven-year marker basically says, this is when I'm going to go ahead and shut down prophecy. I'm going to shut down visions for a while. Until who? At the end of Malachi, who are we looking for? The precursor, the pre-runner, who we understand is John the Baptist. I'm going to be silent until you see that guy come. If you guys see it, put it all together, it's very cool. Now, if you take the seven years and the 62 years, okay, what do you end up with? Well, that's basically 483 years. So 69 seven-year periods is 483 years. Now, in our Gregorian calendar, it kind of messes things up, all right? I broke this down to days before, and, uh, and, and um, we can kind of look at that, but just understand that we're looking at 483 years according to the Jewish calendar. So Messiah would be on the scene 483 after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. I found this chart in Moody's Messianic Bible Prophecy. I'm, when, I, when I finish up with this particular section next week, hopefully next week, because I want to conclude something, I will show you some books to read in case this really heightens your wanting to know more. Daniel is during the 70 year captivity. Okay. His prayer reflects on Israel's past. The vision deals with Israel's prophetic future. Throughout Israel's history, they did not observe sabbatical rest for themselves, for the land. And there's information both contained within a Leviticus, Second Chronicles, and Daniel that basically um, they're being punished 70 years to represent the 490 years of sabbatical mistakes. 70 units, of seven years. So 70 weeks of years. So therefore, they are being punished 70 years. They're being disciplined by God in the Babylonian captivity in representation of their failures of the sabbatical weeks. Isn't that cool? That is awesome. 
So God, loving symmetry, goes, well, 490, 70, 490. You had 70 weeks of years. I'm going to have 70 years of, of exile. And then you have 70 years left until I'm finished with you. And basically when I make all things new. What he does, though, is he says there's going to be 70 years, 70 weeks of years, right? But there's a break here, which is evident within the text, that there's going to be 69, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and then all these different scenarios are going to play out. What we want to be interested in for predictive element is simply that 69-week that 69 concept, that 483-year period. Turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. I'll give you some time because my Bible doesn't open naturally up to 2 Chronicles 36. Second Chronicles 36, 22 through 23. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has commanded me and all kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of his people, may the Lord and his God be with him and let him go up. The decree. If you're a student of the word, prior to Jesus Christ coming, and you read this, you go, oh, Mark. Hit your stopwatch. Start counting. You should be looking for something. So the date of the decree was about 539 B.C. The, in the Ezra chapter 6, verse 14 through 15, the temple was completed around 516 B.C. And in Nehemiah 6.15, the wall around Jerusalem was completed around 445 to 444 B.C. Now go back to Daniel real quick. And there is a question here about when does that actual marker begin? Does it begin at the decree from Cyrus at the end of 2 Chronicles? Does it begin when the temple was completed in Ezra? Or is it completed or is it done when Nehemiah finished building the city wall? All of these events were huge throughout the, and the post-exile age of Israel. And notice it says uh, in verse uh, 25, it will be built again with plaza and moat, even times of distress. And we know in Nehemiah that they were have to basically watch guard because they had enemies all around trying to stop them from working. In fact, they were successful at a time. All the enemies were successful in stopping them from building the temple where Haggai comes in and goes, Hey, you live in nice houses. Why haven't you built God one? And he gives them a very big passionate speech about uh, get back to work. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So which date is it? I'll let you know right now. I don't care. <laughs> I just don't. I, it does, that, doesn't, that does not really impact me as much as other people uh, for other people. Some people try to figure out the exact day, October 5th, zero, this is when Jesus was born. No, stop it, okay? Or some people look at it from the idea of when he walked into the temple. Some people like maybe when he died on the cross. And I'm, and I'm telling you right now, you try to get that exact, we don't have our calendar straight. We're on a Gregorian calendar. They're on a Hebrew calendar. Hebrew calendar has been corrupted over the years. There's, we don't know exactly what day of the week it is, in other words. Creation was day one, right? That's, that's, a, that's a Sunday. Uh, is Sunday Sunday? We have no idea. We don't have a clue. All right? So the total days, according to the Hebrew calendar, remember they have 30-month calendars, would be 
1,000, sorry, pulling up Biden on this one, 1 million trillion, <laughs> 173,880 days. <laughs> sorry, I had to pull that one out there because I did make a mistake. Um, if you actually extrapolate that out to our Gregorian calendar, it's a little bit different than the 483 years. So if you count the days, um, you simply have a general term of idea when it happened. Now, also, did Jesus Christ come in the scene the last week this of the 69th week, or did he come in afterwards? Did the period of time begin? You know, there's a whole bunch of questions which really live as unsettled. What we do know is that at the 69th week, either during it or immediately after it, Messiah is on the scene. So the time of the Messiah fits at, at a last part of the B.C. era and the first third of the A.D. era. That is the end of the 69th week or immediately after the 69th week, regardless of what it is. What you can't do is go, well, 69 weeks, let's go ahead and put that into 2020, where the Jews don't believe in Messiah. They have a problem with the timeline. Go back to Daniel, and they have the temple. They know this. It's within their history. What do you do with Daniel's 70-week prophecy? And they go, I don't. Much like Isaiah 53, they completely ignore Daniel 9. Except for some of like the, the prince details. They're still looking for that kind of stuff. They completely ignore it. So with all this understood, the Jews should have been looking for the revelation of the Messiah around 400 to 450 years after the events in 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. I don't want to be overly specific here. I know some people love the number and try to figure it out from 444 B.C. There's a question about that because the decree was given back in, um, back in 539. But they don't like it because it doesn't round well. I'm like, I don't, I really don't care about the specifics. All I know is that that's that era between the end of the BC and the beginning of the AD. That is when the 69 weeks would have been completed. It's the only time in history the 69 weeks would have been completed. And that is very comforting. They should have been looking. And I believe the people who saw them. I believe the people who recognize that this is the, the Savior understood Daniel 9. I think they were looking. So a, a quick conclusionary mo uh, note. After six lessons, we have a basis and an introduction into how the Old Testament, that is the Hebrew Scriptures, demonstrates that theme. The theme we've been talking about for the last six lessons. That who would read the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through the Prophets would understand there's there's waiting for something something's on the cusp of happening even if they got it earlier they can look forward and say you know what in 300 years messiah is going to be on the scene and then as they move forward what happened during the time they lost sight even daniel had to go back and read jeremiah to understand there were 70 years you would think that jeremiah making that prophecy would be on everyone's lips from the, from year one one down, 69 years to go. Two down, 68. They didn't. They completely lost sight of it. Daniel is the one who had to bring it to attention after reading the book of Jeremiah. They would understand that this prince would come, that this Messiah would come. Our lessons have traversed from Genesis to the prophets, from generality to specifics, from an unknown time to a timeline. That is beautiful and supernatural and divine. That concludes the messianic hope, but we're not done really. Because next lesson will be the messianic hope revealed. How does Jesus Christ complete this picture? How... Can we have absolute confidence that Jesus did fulfill the messianic hope? Now, there's still messi messianic promises from the Old Testament that have not yet been completed. That is in the yet-to-be-fulfilled category. 
but we can understand that the what he has fulfilled really does give us credence and understanding so that we will have confidence and understand how to use the Old Testament scriptures as Paul did to prove to people that Jesus Christ is the Messiah from the predictive elements of the Old Testament. After I get done with that class, I'll go ahead and put out the books or you know show them on screen for you all to go ahead and and, and if you want to di dive into this, there's a lot of good information out there and, and a lifetime of study if you want. <laughs> have fun. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll go ahead and uh, pick up uh, with Ephesians next hour. God in heaven, thank you for your predictive elements. You didn't just leave us to chance or just give us some ideas or thoughts or subjective reason. You, you actually gave us your word throughout all of history, telling us the end from the beginning so that we would have confidence that you are God and there is no one else. We thank you that you are not only real, true, but a gracious God, God of love. And in conjunction with your justice, you sent your son to die in our place as a sacrificial atonement so that we would have our sins forgiven and we would be able to obtain the righteousness, your righteousness, so that we would be able to spend eternity with you, not by works, but by grace. Thank you. Help us to ponder these things, to study these things. Help it to change our mind. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.